get into the telencephalon, another cat. Before it rained, you'll recall from our early embryo, where we have the sulcus limitans dividing association of motor plates and the sensory plate ganglia out. Uh, the periphery coming from neural crest with the midbrain, hindbrain, cervical segments, three divisions of the hindbrain, the botnia nodular lobe developing from the middle hindbrain, uh, the rest of the cerebellum developing from the anterior hindbrain, the inferior and superior curriculi developing from the midbrain, the region of the third ventricle. Developing as the diencephalon, uh, and then laterally, the protrusions out as Mickey Mouse ears of the telencephalon. In relation to each of the lateral ventricles, we discuss the. Diencephalon in relation to epithalamus, dorsal and ventral thalamus, hypothalamus. And with respect to the protrusion from the ventral anterior surface here of the optic system. And we have a similar protrusion from the telencephalon, the olfactory. In close relation to the frame of Monroe, we have a collar of tissue that develops into the striatum. Corpus pallidus uh, coming from the hypothalamus diencephalon to meet with the striatum lateral to the internal capsule. The striatum consisting of caudate and cutamen, artificially divided by the internal capsule fibers. With the <coughs> internal capsule uh, able to develop, after the adhesion between telencephalon and diencephalon, as the future occipital temporal lobes develop backwards and spiral around, lateral to the diencephalon, of course, they become adherent to the dorsal, lateral, and eventually inferior portion of the diencephalon. With that migration, we have the migration of the striatum, cardiac body tail, and of the next adjacent tissue, which is the limbic system, the migrating to the capital formation. And it spirals around in the temporal lobe, leaving the trail for the fornix. So our analysis of the Telencephalon is going to consider in sequence the olfactory system, the limbic system, the neocortex, and because we need the neocortex to project on the striatum, we'll come to the striatum and the basal ganglionic connections within the diencephalon uh, towards the end. <coughs> So any questions at this point on the general organization, general embryologic approach? If you can keep this in mind, you understand the lamina and the fixa.
which is the adhesion of teosephalon to niacephalon. And so does that turn into the capsule? Uh, it turns into an adhesion such that the thalamus develops a intimate relation to the lateral ventricle, which you would not expect embryologically otherwise. You would expect the thalamus to have relation only to third ventricle, which it does immediately. But except for a little area, the bare area between the lamina of fixa and the roof of the diencephalon, the rest of the dorsal lateral diencephalon becomes adherent to the cunicephalon, and so develops a relationship dorsally to the lateral ventricle, and then to the striatum, which spirals around, and underneath the temporal lobe will have the upside down version of that, the temporal lateral ventricle and the tail of the body. Then, while all that's developing, I'll show you back up, Mr. Uh, between the lamina of fixa on either side and above the roof of the diencephalon, we have a space which is a subarachnoid space. As the medium time surrounding the nervous system disintegrates into a subarachnoid space, the little tiny wedge shaped space at the back end of Monroe's frame widens as the lamina fixa is forced laterally by the cunicephalon going around, spiraling around the diencephalon. That space becomes wider and wider to go posteriorly in that space, a subarachnoid space, cave them. Really interposite. which is by itself essentially insignificant, except as a reminder of how the teocephalon develops around the diencephalon. And then the last piece of this little puzzle to keep track of, of course, is the commissural plate, which develops in here just in front of Monroe's foramen, in the dorsal portion of the lamina terminalis, um, so that uh, that allows for the development of three major commercial systems of the geocephalon. Uh, the anterior commissure, the hippocampal commissure, both of which are very quite small, and then the massive corpus callosum. But by having all three of those develop next to each other in this same region, you can then begin to account for their continuity of development uh, and displacement of the hippocampal commissure posteriorly. Um, and of course, between the developing hippocampal commissure and corpus callosum, we have the septal boostum. In this cavity, secondary development as a process of process. So any any problems now? Keep your eyes focused on the anterior commissure which stands firmly placed just in front of Monroe's frame. Those two uh, structures, Raymond Monroe 
anti-commissary are essentially fixed. Once you can identify them, then you can look for what ought to be next to them. The rest of the amount of term now is below, and you have to tie us in. Or the third ventricle is too ethereal. Or going the other way, the roof of the third ventricle is poorly flexible. Or going out in the human set line, the drawn back to the capital commissary and the pornic system, and the greatly magnified rostral, caudal portions of corpus callosum. Well, let's begin with the olfactory system. Here we have an anterior commissure, optic chiasm, mammary bodies, laminar terminalis, pituitary stop, and floor of third ventricle. The roof of the third ventricle with poric plexus. The posterior commissure and the roof of the aqueduct, or the aqueduct of the fourth ventricle, which is up here. The colliculi and cerebellum. The midbrain, pons, dulla, like so. And above the posterior commissure, we have the protrusion of the pineal. The avenular commissure. And the suprapineal recess. Of the third ventricle. The poric plexus of the third ventricle is going to turn around in the rose frame and continue on out into the poric plexus of the lateral ventricle. And this is the space in here between these two, the acavum, the interposity, which we just mentioned over here as this telencephalon swings back and leaves this subarachnoid space above the roof, rather than just lateral to the roof of the third ventricle. Okay, that's so much for orientation, probably. Let's go now to the orbital frontal lobe, the frontal pole, and around the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, and around this way. Now, if I do this right, I'd like to put the fornic system in place. Coming down into the mammary body, let's put it backwards here. Fornic coming around into the temporal lobe. Hidden, of course, by the midbrain and other diencephalic structures there. The corpus callosum, coming to the anterior commissural region, swinging around this posterior portion, like so. So here we have the genu, and here the splenium. And the body of the corpus callosum. And so we have the anterior commissure, optic chiasm, memory body. And the fornix. So the fornix really is just kind of hiding the hippocampal commissure. Or 
Thank you. Uh, that adds a question I want to pose. The first question I want to pose was what's between Fornix and Corpus Closum? Which is basically nothing more or less than the thinned out, attenuated portion of the commissure plate as these structures migrate back and acquire more and more fibers. This happens to become stretched between corpus closum and fornix. And now you asked about the cable commissure, which occurs back here, the other side. Having been drawn back, getting here just behind the, just with the intercommissure, but drawn back as the structure migrate around the projected load. And so the last place it can be really is between the two fornices and they approach each other in the end of the time, so it's meaning. Posterior commissure just has its own completely separate. Posterior commissure is uh, its own separate, uh, essentially a midbrain diencephalic structure connecting the two, uh, well, I guess essentially all of the posterior diencephalic structures, containing also probably five cortical ocular motor of the conjugate gauge system we mentioned earlier. The Avenger commissure here, a little tiny structure, uh, having its own essentially private path between the two of the the ganglia and the reflex bundle <coughs> from the ganglia. And that's the bundle that goes to the red And that's the bundle that comes from the Avenger ganglion. On your side. Crossing in the Avenger commissure and giving rise to fibers that come forward and then bend down, bending around the red nucleus and on the inner nucleus. And coming to the Avenger ganglion, the old epithelomic striad, which serves as the attachment for the roof of the third ventricle, which is called plexus. But we did also come in from the telencephalon, diencephalon, basal olfactory, cephalar, a very diffuse uh, origin of fibers coming here to form the epithelium. All right. And it's really the continuation of the um, Street of Terminalis, which spirals around parallel to the choroid plexus, parallel to the striatum, parallel to the thorax. So if if we on this, if we have a case in which the corpus closum does not develop, or the genesis of the corpus closum, that's a blue structure. It's not there. Where is the fornix? Should be 
This is essentially normal position. It's going to migrate around the temporal lobe, going with the rest of the gencephalon. But where is the temporal function? The only place it can be is up here by the old chromosome plate. There is no other crossing taken away as a major crossing system in order to give us a valid answer. So there is no other way. Why wouldn't it still migrate back? I'm sorry? Why doesn't it still migrate back? If it did, say we had the Mickey Mouse ears here, and the cornic system is going back around like so, being pushed further and further to the side, but the only crossing place being between my two ears, through my head, how am I going to have it cross, a persistent crossing, if I drag my ears back, take my ears and drag them around, and there's no innate way that I can get my two ears and touch them again. The only reason we can do that is that with my ears and the cornix and the corpus callosum, all starting here, they can be distorted, migrate almost any place we want to, and put the hippocampal curvature almost anywhere we want. But only at the tip of the point. We have the corpus callosum crossing between the two sides, and so we've maintained the commissure of plate, basically, between the two hemispheres. So do you really look at the hippocampal commissure as just kind of an extension of the spleen almost? No, it's an entirely separate system. It's the hippocampal mammalo tract, mammary body tract. There's almost no other connection except to itself on the other side, and it slops a little into the hypothalamus, but it's almost a part of the gut. I had a thought in the history. If it's clear so far, all I have to do now is to say that in the region of the developing anterior commissure, that over some of these fibers in the hippocampal commissure and in the cornix that were in front of the anterior commissure. And if you now accept that, then you can see how these fibers might persist above the corpus callosum as the supercallosal remnants, hippocampal remnants, or inducing fusium. I'm not quite sure how to spell this. Inducing fusium. And then you can understand perhaps how some of the cornix fibers taking off in the temporal lobe swing around and come to lie as pre-commissural fibers that will join back with the rest of the cornix fibers into the hypothalamus and memory fibers. That's okay. Then we have some of these fibers forcing through, except the glucidum, to reach the cornix either behind or in front of the anterior commissure. So if you made a lead in just the anterior to the anterior commissure, you'd expect to see 
basically not much degeneration in the mammillary body, but most of it in the septal area. Do you think the candle projection for that? I think that's right. Um, degeneration of fibers. Right. Uh, molar degeneration going into the mammary bodies and into the hypothalamus. That would probably not be the easiest place right. to make a section avoiding other systems. But uh, it would catch these pre functional fibers. And those don't have any you know, functions. I don't know of any separate function in part of the limbic system. Um, now, just to finish up that geometry of the agents of corpus callosum, um, about 10% of the fibers of the corpus callosum are not point to point homologous points from right to left, but are heterologous, frontal, parietal, frontal, occipital, and so on. And light gray fibers, so called decussated by the common shirl system. They appear to come in late after the common shirl fibers have been there, and they can come in and go light gray fibers. If there's no corpus callosum, they can't find that bed in which to travel. Um, but I suppose they would have two theoretical choices one to come down and reason an the common shirl. The other, which most of them should take, is stay at your lateral and become frontal or septal or parietal on the same side, right across. And that seems to account for Probst's bundle. Uh, which comes in varying sizes up to about 10% of the fibers of corpus callosum. And is it located next to what? Now I'll take away the body of the corpus callosum. So you've got singular gyrus above, cortex, and cortex. Rudiments of septum. different bundle of fibers than the fornix because there's a little tissue uh, well, gray matter uh, between the two. Okay, any problems? Oh, the olfactory system begins with um, hair cells. In the nasal olfactory mucosa. That send their axons through perforations in the bone a cribriform plate between the nose and the cranial cavity and on Dendrites, mostly in granule cells. That 
then send their axons to nitro cells. These structures being in the olfactory bulb. axons sweep out next to the olfactory superorofrontal cortex as the olfactory tract. To end in the basal olfactory cortex which consists of cortex on either side above the optic chiasm. And so to, well, they, as they come back, they spread, immediately coming up here next to the lamina terminalis into the so-called paroblactic cortex. And laterally, which I can't show in this diagram, out into the anterior perforate space. The anterior perforate space receiving that name because of the perforations, penetrations by branches of the circulus, mostly in the circle. And so to show that, I'd better show you the base of the branch we looked up here. Let's have the olfactory nerves, chiasm, nerve, nerve, chiasm, tract, nerve, chiasm, tract. The pituitary stalk in the dibulum lies in here. The um, two carotid arteries here, that's matter to the chiasm. The um, uh, two orbital frontal uh, portions of the brain, the midline empty here, from full up here. And uh, then out in here, we're going to have the temporal lobe coming out. So we've got temporal pole, uh, orbital funnel, the lateral fissure, which is obscured here by the temporal pole. Uh, in which is going to run the red middle street library. And coming off of that, the anterior street library. Hidden by the optic nerve part. And from these arteries, we have branches hair-like branches coming down. Into this space, there's an anterior basal olfactory cortex, excuse me, the back up cluster, the olfactory bulb, this continuation of the tract, 
in the back in a sulcus between the gyrus rectus or straight to the gyrus and the medial medial orbital frontal cortex sulcus I think being known as a olfactory sulcus and as these fibers come back they'll split into a medial which I've got to show here coming up into the cortex immediately lateral to lateral terminalis and lateral and intermediate and we have a fanning out of these olfactory fibers into this anteriperiphery space and best seen in a a uh, fetal brain just as the temporal pole is developed, just as the insular cortex is beginning to be covered by the opercular frontal parietal temporal opercular. At that stage, you can see the olfactory tract coming back into the base of the insula. And as the temporal pole swings over the insula to form the temporal opercular, some of this basal olfactory insular cortex, which is grossly insular in the fetal brain, gets bent around on the top surface of the temporal pole. And so we have some of these fibers coming around and bending up onto the superior temporal pole. This bend is known as the Lyman insulator. And in the uh, formed brain, from, from uh, say 32 weeks gestation on, this angle between the temporal pole and the insula, the basal olfactory cortex, is a very sharp line. Uh, it's, uh, the temporal pole comes forward, and the basal olfactory cortex is up here, and a very sharp line that, in effect, separates the temporal lobe from the insular cortex. Allows the middle super artery branch to run in the subractor spaces over. But that very sharp line results in this curve being a very sharp angle. Not a sweeping curve and not a flat plate that you see in the field brain. That's all the olfactory system you need, or animals need, for conditioned reflexes. And you take out all of the other cortex, including the limbic system, and still have conditioned reflexes to smell the system. So if the basic olfactory connection are are from the basal olfactory cortex back into hypothalamus and passing through hypothalamus as medial forebrain bundle going 
back into a particular formation. And so sweeping back through the hypothalamus at the medial forebrain line. And picking up other fibers from the aerobactic cortex, from the septal area, that sweep into the system and contribute to the fibers running through the lateral hypothalamus. Is the hypothalamus itself using that? Is there a nuclei in the hypothalamus then? Or is it mainly from outside? As far as I know, these are making polysynaptic connections with the lateral hypothalamus, as with the particular formation. But if somebody asks what's in the medial forebrain tunnel, you're mainly getting the main correct responses. It's peril factory and septal area cortex sending fibers through, making connections in the hypothalamus and going on through the hypothalamus. Right. And some will come up here, join in with the epithelial stria, to go back to the midline ganglion, and so on. And in some animals, in the mouse in particular, some of these medial fibers of the olfactory tract enter into the angiocarmature and cross the other side. So that the mouse has a rather significant olfactory crossing in the angiocarmature, which, as far as I know, is a very small component of the angiocarmature in larger animals. Now, as you probably know, the limbic system, the schematic and metaphoric system, was historically included under the term rind and cephalon, meaning olfactory brain. And that was sort of dealt a death blow when Cordell again discovered that the whale has no olfactory nerves to follow the track, but has a well-developed limbic system. And so that, coupled with Papes' concept of the limbic system, having to do with emotions and whatnot, sort of said that this limbic system is quite distinct from, although it receives some input from olfactory, it's essentially a non-olfactory system. So how big is the whale brain that you have to dissect out? How big would you guess the whale brain is? Depends on the whale. I suppose we're going to have small whales, but one of the smaller whale-type animals I'm familiar with is the Sterciops, the elephant, so-called. They stand about six feet tall, if they stand on their tails. And their brain is at least as big as the human. And how much smaller a whale can be, I'm not quite sure. But the whale that I had, not in my hands, but I saw on the docks there, was about 65 feet long, and had a skull that was about that thick, solid bone, and chainsaws going through it, and the bone dust all over the place. It was a mess. But the brain was 4,500 grams, three-plus times the size of a human. It was a gigantic specimen. I've got a picture of it in my picture disc. And very similar to the Sterciops, it was a smaller edition. They're both cetaceans, I think. And 
very, very complicated cortex, very complicated basal nerves, uh, mostly hypervasal branches. We have this very big tongue, uh, particularly the baleen whales. Uh, but uh, I mean, the tongue is the size of the stable. Two tables. <laughs> Gigantic structure. <laughs> complicated auditory system. They're in our sonar. So a lot of their brain development sure relates to processing auditory input. Every now and then we show a photograph of it. And so as though it were a human, but a gross malformation. <laughs> um, but it sits in there. Any other questions, comments? Isn't there, even in humans, is there some kind of crossed connection from one olfactory, from their deep nucleus or something in the olfactory bulb that connects to the other side or something like that? Okay. Um, thank you for reminding me. What I've called anteriorperiphery space uh, contains cortex, which is not laminated like the rest of it is. It's broken up into clusters of cells that have a variety of names, which I've really never bothered to learn uh, systematically, right? but includes islands of Kalea. Stays on the outside. Is the um, 
Bait and place of destroying terminalis in there or is that somewhere else? I'm sorry, what was that? The bed nucleus of the striated terminalis. I've heard the name. The moment it's not jelly, it's where it is. It probably... Well, the striated terminalis is coming partly from the amygdaloid nucleus down here in the temporal lobe. And so I'm guessing the bed nucleus is somewhere near that. But I don't know. It could be received, it could be more closely related to olfactory cortex and contributing fibers up here in the epigenetic stria and in striated terminalis, which are continuous. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other points? So these, the islands of Kulia, the diagonal mountain broke all the anterior perforating spaces. You say that is in frontal cortex or just has it in any of the parietal or any of those, it's just its own category. It probably depends on how you want to look at it from either a gross or an embryologic point of view. From a gross point of view, it's posterior extension of olfactory frontal lobe. The medial extension of the basal insular cortex. And embryologically, it's in that junctional area. From a, well, if you begin to define lobes in other than gross terms, all the rest of the frontal cortex ought to be laminated. All the rest of the insular cortex ought to be laminated. All the rest of the temporal cortex ought to be laminated. And so it's this basal tissue, which is perforated by blood vessels that are going in to supply these deep nuclei. And embryologically, it hasn't developed laminate. So it's broken up into groups of cells, clusters of cells, islands of cells. And what one could call a primitive system. But if you don't like primitive, just call it an olfactory system. It's characteristic of the olfactory system to be different. It penetrates bone, the bulb, the tract, and it's spread out endings on the base of the brain. Any other problems? Is it the special sensory cells that degenerate with age? I assume they do, yeah. Humans, most humans don't use the olfactory system very much. There are professionals, perfumers, wine tasters, others who can classify hundreds of odors. There are animals, I understand, who can do much better than that. And it's essentially a chemoreceptor. Specific molecules, olfactory molecules, that stimulate particular cells and transmit particular messages. And in a highly olfactory type animal, efficiency, one can show firing of different cells to different odors. And very common, I guess, for humans to lose their sense of smell as they get older. And I think it's the primary sensory neuron that disintegrates. 
dying off is not fixed. It's a system that can be cured and be paralyzed very simply by toxic materials, which gasoline is supposed to be one of the best. So if you want to blindfold or olfactory control a person good at smell, you must whiff gasoline first. The whole system rapidly deteriorates and you can't do anything to control it. But you don't very often use it in clinical practice. It occasionally comes in handy. With an olfactory groove and a geoma, one can theoretically lose the sense of smell on one side and preserve it on the other. And, of course, with temporal lobe seizures, one can develop hallucinations of smell, almost always in relation to tumors in the medial temporal region, very rarely with non-tumors. But with head trauma, the favorite site of damage, because of the roughness of the base itself, the sphenoid wing coming in there between the temporal lobe and frontal lobe, and the roof of the orbit sitting up in a very rough fashion, as the brain swirls against the sphenoid wing or against the roof of the orbit, the orbital frontal, temporal polar, olfactory bulbs and tracts get contused. And so one can very easily have post-traumatic anosmia. And we have some examples showing that. Laser disc program. Anything else? I probably should mention avine encephalopathy and colon closed encephalopathy, but I'll save those for another time. One can have a selective loss of olfactory development. The pure avine encephalopathy. And what Dr. Shaw has found is that in those cases, if you do serial sections, you can find a little tiny stub of the olfactory bulb back here at this junction between the orbital frontal and temporal polar. It's right where it should be. And that is frequently associated with Coleman's syndrome. This is mental retardation and testicular atrophy on a genetic basis. The more severe olfactory closed encephalopathy is better seen when there's a little bit more about the limbic system. One of the striking things of that is instead of having the cornices going front to back, the hippocampal commissure back here, they go side to side. So the whole cornice system is essentially hippocampal commissure. And that seems to relate to the fact that we don't have two pyramidal nodes, but two different nodes. There's actually one in front of the whole cerebral hemisphere nodes, in front rather than on the side. So tomorrow is Friday. Thank you.